Good morning, Southside. It's the Lord's Day. How beautiful. Um, I don't know who can get me a thing of water. Is Wayne here? Uh, I will not make it through this without some water. So, oh no. Two on a cup is bad luck. <laughs> There's lipstick on that. I don't want that, brother. <clears throat> <laughs> Special welcome to anyone uh, who's visiting. We're grateful to have you here with us. We were going over some of the ministries, and I just wanted to bring a couple up with you. Greg mentioned the newcomers class, and this is such an important time with anyone who is new to the church to just get to know your leaders, hear their hearts, the heart for this ministry, to know each other, share testimonies. It's just really a a blessed time, so I really encourage you to sign up for that coming class. Um, Ladies Retreat, they are going to be doing what's called Entrench. The word entrench means to establish solidly something so, f- oh, you're beautiful, so firmly that it cannot be changed. And so they're gathering to, to cultivate Christian contentment. And there are three things that they're going to look at that fight against Christian contentment. And one is comparison. The other is difficult circumstances. And then the third one is going to be past calamities. And they're going to gather, there'll be prayer, fellowship. There's kind of this way that you will sit with 21 people before it's all over. So if you're looking to get to know people in this church, this will be a great way to come and pour out your hearts and entrench together uh, to live in contentment in our King, in a land that is discontent. Uh, A few um, community groups, there's a new one starting up at Dry 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 Creek in Quebec. That was what was messing with me, Quebec. Um, it's going to be at the Ortiz house, and they're going to go through screw tape later, letters, and after that, the Gospel of John. Uh, young marrieds are starting back up after the holiday weekend as well, and they're going to be looking at the book, The Gospel-Centered Marriage. It's outstanding, and that will be September 10th. So if you've never come to that and desire to just take a season to lock in and uh, laying that strong foundation in your marriage, I invite you to that. Um, AVL, sound, uh, we need volunteers. You know, if, if, if you, <laughs> when you know Jesus Christ, you want to serve his body. And so there's just some needs to come and serve in that way. The greeters are always looking uh, for people to help in that ministry. And the nursery, number, number one way to help uh, young families get in there and love on these kids. Uh, uh, when the Driscolls left last Sunday, she told me all these little kids were running up, hugging her leg. And I go, how'd you know all those kids? She said, from the nursery. And so what a beautiful ministry to love those children and pour into them that way. All right, that's for free. This morning, if you will turn to Romans chapter 8, my favorite chapter in the whole Bible, Romans 8. I don't want to finish it. I just, I'm enjoying it so much that I, we're just going to look at one verse this morning. Verse 17, and the, the good news is next week I'm shooting for eight verses in one Sunday. So you pray for me. Verses 18 through 25 will be on your bulletin next week. But we're going to finish up this little section that we've been laboring in now for weeks and a month. Verses 12 through 17. (laughs) God desires that we have assurance of the great promise of salvation that he gives us in Christ. He, He wants us to know that we're children of God. Because that is so foundational to our faith, our hope, and our love that the enemy will attack it constantly. It will, he'll always be coming to disrupt that and shake it up. His best lie is to put you back under law in your thinking, back under condemnation, a spirit of slavery and fear. In verse 15, we don't have that kind of spirit. We have a spirit of Abba, Father. And so we have really slowed down and we're laboring in his word because I want you all filled with joy and full assurance for the obedience of the faith to the glory of God alone. And so this is big, what we've been studying, and we're going to finish this little section up this morning, Lord willing. So here's the outline that we've been using to journey together, if you'll look with me. Paul's going to give us four ways that the Holy Spirit shows that we're children of God, how he gives us assurance. And we, we saw in verses 12 through 13 that we're no longer debtors to the flesh, but now by the Spirit, we're putting to death the deeds of the body. And then in verse 14, 
Uh, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. So our first point, the Spirit of God leads us. And he leads us now to anything that hurts our relationship with God. We hate sin. And in, now within the new heart, I, I, I want to just live for God. I don't want to transgress him and live against him. And so the Spirit of God will lead me to hate sin, to fight it. And I'm not talking perfection, but a hatred of it and a fight. And I won't give up. I keep fighting because the Spirit of God keeps leading me to put to death the deeds of the body. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Secondly, the Holy Spirit frees me. In verse 15, you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. And so we, we hate everything that ruins that relationship and we love the relationship. I, I want Father. I want Abba. I want communion with God. I want Daddy. I look to Him. He's it. There's no longer condemnation and fear. There's the safety of a child coming to God now with all that confidence and security and what this gospel brings. The Holy Spirit frees us to be children of God. Thirdly, last time we were together in verse 16, the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. So the Holy Spirit um, is within us and He assures us. He assures us that we are the children of God. And it all just feeds together. That assurance causes me to to put to death the deeds of the body. It causes me this morning to hope. It causes me to endure affliction. And these all are so synergistic. They're all just working and feeding off each other. But I think the sweetest thing I, I have ever known is blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. That the Spirit testifies. He's mine. You can't can't do anything to that person. And so just what a gift that the Spirit testifies with ours that we are children of God. And now we'll look at our last point. The fourth point is he rewards me. I I get a child's reward. And verse 17, if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we also might be glorified with him. He rewards us. He rewards us with an inheritance, glory. And, and this, this morning he says he rewards us with suffering. How, how do those two marry? Glory being with God forever and suffering. And that's what we're going to look at this morning, how those two, they just seem so opposite and only the, the truth of God and his spirit can marry these two. And that's what we'll see this morning. So uh, we better pray because those two don't merge easily and we need to understand how they do because in our flesh, we just separate them. And this morning I'm asking that God would show you the beauty of the suffering that he brings into our lives for our good and his glory. So let's pray. Father, I come before you and I do thank you that you are our father, Abba. I thank you for what Christ has done, and now we can draw near with confidence. We can draw near as children. I come to you with so much confidence in your love. We ask you this morning to do more than we could hope or ask or believe. Bring these two together in our minds, our hearts, our conscience. Lord, help us to understand your ways, for they're not the ways of the world. Your ways are always the opposite of this cosmos. And so I pray by your spirit that you would teach us. Teach us to be those who embrace suffering, who aren't knocked off the course, who continue marching on to Zion with the plan that you have decreed for each one of our lives. And it will not be fantasy island from now to glory. For you said it's through many tribulations that we'll enter into this kingdom. And so I pray, God, teach us this morning. Show us from your word, reveal the beauty and the truth of what we look at in this verse. Open it up to our minds and our hearts this morning, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Verse 17, for children, he rewards me. And so this is big, and what I want to start this morning with is he says he gives us an inheritance. 
<clears throat> an inheritance is that which we inherit at the death of a parent or a relative or a friend. Or I don't know if you're like me. I get these people that send me messages from all over the world that say they want to give me all their money if I'll just give them my bank account number. <clears throat> and I just, it's so sweet to think that I could get an inheritance if I just give them my bank account number. It's just such a beautiful concept, inheritance. Except we see that it's caused division among many families and relatives throughout history. I've counseled it a lot. And this, this can be so consuming that a, a man could run up to Jesus, teacher, tell him to give me my inheritance. He's so burdened about it. And it seems to me that the larger the inheritance, the more fighting that goes on in a family. Well, today we're going to probably look at the, the, for sure, the largest inheritance that has ever been given or known in the history of the world. The biggest and best inheritance. And, the, and this is crazy. The family members won't fight over it. It's not because it's so large that you get your part and I get my part. And there'll just be so much with the infinity that we just won't fight. But we're, we all, the children of God, share we have koinonia, we have fellowship in this great inheritance that will be described this morning. And we have it in perfect unity and community and in love. And there's no jealousy or greed. I, I am not jealous of your inheritance. I love it. I look at it and I can't wait for you to get it. It's just a, a shared abundance of the infinitude of God. That's what we're going to get. Who can get their arms around this one? This one blew my mind all week. Paul's logic in our text, your sons and daughters of God, you cry then, Abba. The Spirit bears witness with your spirit and you rejoice. And if you're a child, you will get the inheritance of a child. And I want you to hear this. All that the Father has is laid up for us. And it's promised and it's absolutely certain. And this whole chapter, if you're justified which we've been learning by faith alone, you will be glorified. Nothing can stop that process. God wants you to see that, that nothing can thwart it. If you're adopted, you will get the family's treasure. It's yours. At the last will and testament, so to speak, your name will be in it. You all will have your name read. You know what it's going to say? Everything. You inherit everything. Everything. And this is, this is just so amazing, and we're going to unpack it. What this does to our present hope and our present reality is pretty amazing. I spent some time a while back with a man who has a very large inheritance upon his father's passing. And it's been amazing to watch. It drives everything that he does. He takes out loans against it. He, he lives like he has it all now. Like it's such a reality to him. He's living today like I already have it. It affects his daily life based on the, insert, the certainty of the inheritance that's going to come to him. And as I watched this, it intrigued me like crazy. He doesn't worry about money. doesn't worry about needs. He just knows I got inheritance. And the power of inheritance upon this man, whether good or bad, was mighty. And it's amazing for me to see what inheritance can do to a person. And that is what Paul is doing for us this morning. You have an inheritance like no other. And we're going to count it this morning. Get out your phones, your abacus. It's where all of history is moving. No one even carries calculators anymore, do they? I was going to say calculator, that wouldn't work. All of history is moving to the culmination of your salvation. You've been saved to what? You've been saved to this. You went from the courtroom. Remember I said we can't just live our lives in the courtroom. Justified. We've got to come into the living room. Adopted. Abba. Father. And now we're going to come into the vault. <laughs> the vault room. Let's count it. This is to affect the way that we live our lives. We call it a gospel hope. And a gospel hope is absolute Certainty. The child of God, this is your inheritance, signed an internal document in the blood of Jesus Christ and sealed by the Holy Spirit. It's yours. And too often, we're like that man that I mentioned. I have to have it all now. 
I can't deny myself and wait for this inheritance that's coming. I will borrow now. I have to have it today. I have to have the good life. I have to have the best life now. I have to leave my mark in this world. I need health, wealth, and prosperity. I need all of my plans to work out. I need, I need, I need. And if it doesn't happen that way, I'm undone. It's American Christianity, what I just described. It's one of the greatest motivations to put to death the deeds of the body that cry, get pleasure right now at any cost. Here, this will satisfy you, something other than God. And to look at this inheritance and say, that's what's coming for me. Anything you offer me will never be better than this, this eternity with Christ that awaits me. So to mortify by the Spirit is to hope in what is laid up for me. Temptation loses its power when you're looking and hoping for this inheritance that God has for you. A certain inheritance like no other. Do you believe it? If children, then heirs also. And I can live like that man I mentioned. I can worry for nothing. I can borrow on this hope daily. I think about it all day long. It drives all that I do. It empowers me when I'm discouraged and down. It affects how I think about this life and everyone in it. The power of inheritance is amazing. So what is this inheritance that is ours as the children of God? Let's look at that now. Look with me in verse 17. And if children, heirs also. This is very universal. If children, and I want you to hear this, every child in the family of God will get this inheritance. In the world, inheritances many times go to those who loved them the most or took the most care of them. Who did the most for me? They'll get, they'll get the mo- most of my inheritance. With God, it doesn't matter even when you were born into the family. It doesn't matter how many years of service. Do you remember the parable of the laborers where he hires them at the beginning of the day and promises them a wage and then he hires people towards the end of the day and he gives them the same wage and they're mad? Like, wait a minute, we, we worked all day and they came at the end and they got the same in reward. Same for the kingdom of God. The love of God is the same to all of his children. He loves us in Christ. He loves us perfectly and infinitely. And though you feel insignificant or small, Your inheritance is the same. Charles Spurgeon said, your name is just as prominently written upon the heart of Christ as the names of his apostles are. So what we look at this morning, the inheritance among the saints is fully yours if you are a child of God, as it was to David, Abraham, Paul, Peter, Mary, etc. I just want you to get that. It's the same inheritance for all. So let's look at it. Let's open up our portfolio. Before we look at this in verse 17, I've been just reading through Romans going, is there any other parts that talk about this? And there is. Uh, Romans 4.13, I want to start there. Paul wrote this. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that we would be heir of the world, those who inherit the world, was not through the law, but it was through the righteousness of faith. And so this inheritance is going to come by faith and not by your works. And so the whole earth, and Galatians 3.29, if you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. And so all who have faith this morning will inherit the earth. You're going to get the whole thing. I've seen people so excited when they inherited a little small cabin in the mountains, a vacation home in Florida. I'm going to own all of Colorado. I don't, I don't care. I'm going to own the United States. I'm going to own Italy. And I'm going to go and eat all the food and never be gluttonous ever again. And I've had some people say, I can't be happy without owning a house. I get it. It's good. But you know what? I want everyone to hear this. You're going to own the whole world. It's all going to be yours. And paupers on earth will get all of this one day. And I'm just not jealous of those who have some now. 
My battle is not to be cocky. When rich people sneer at me because I don't know which fork to eat with at a nice restaurant. They put two there. How do you know which one? And they look down on you if you grab the wrong one. It doesn't even bother me. I wear shorts, a t-shirt, and a sweat-stained soft black ball cap to fancy restaurants, believe it or not. It's all going to be mine one day. Don't you think that that should affect you today as you journey this inheritance? You don't have to get it all now. It's coming. This train is bound for glory. I love having my voice back. I'm a little... Second, you get the whole earth, but you're going to get a renewed earth with renewed bodies. And next week, we're going to look at that, so I'm not going to park on it too much. But in verses 18 through 25, it says, creation is groaning for our redemption. And so our bodies are groaning in verse 23 for we're going to be redeemed and we're going to have redeemed bodies and and we're going to live on a redeemed earth. And it's just, I can't even imagine what's coming. Creation's going to be set free. What will it be like with a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells? But I can't enjoy this world now as I want because my health, I, I can't walk as far as I want and do all the things I want to do. You're going to get a glorified body and you're groaning for this body with no more sin, no more decay, no more weakness. Uh, people want that now. And young people, you're, you can sometimes get close to it, but it's going to go away. I, I feel like Barnabas this morning, the son of encouragement. Your bodies are going to wear out. Gravity will win. You're going to lose. You're going to weaken. And the hope is not, I just want to keep it. I want to save it. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be renewed and made perfect, and it's never going to wear out for billions and billions of years. Your body will never decay, and you're, you're groaning. I won't have any more sin in this crazy thing. I don't need body beautiful now. Do you know you're going to be tempted to worship my body then? (laughs) That's grace. Health battles, gone. Smoke affecting your voice, gone. Disease, gone. Everything's going to be gone. And the Christian is the one sitting here hoping for that day. I can't wait for the new heavens and new earth and I own it all. It's all going to be mine. I can wait for that third. We'll talk about that hope next week. Go to our text in Romans 8, 17. (laughs) And if your children, heirs also, heirs of God. And the question that needs to be answered right here is this is what's called either a subjective genitive or an objective genitive. And some of you do not care, but it matters. Let's take, for example, the love of God. If God is the subject, which is a subjective genitive, The phrase refers to God's love to us. And if this is an objective genitive, it refers to that we have love for God. And so it makes a big difference which kind of genitive it is. And so we come to this word, heirs of God, is it subjective or objective? And and so if it's subjective, it means we belong to God as heirs. And if it's objective, let your breath be taken away. We have God as our inheritance. And every scholar I could read that's worth his salt said it's an objective genitive. The context demands it. And so I want you to hear this new heavens and a new earth. I get God. He's my inheritance. I believe that the context is objective, which, which it makes the inheritance so beautiful. When I start looking at my inheritance, what is it? I get God. I don't just get the world. I get the one who created it. I get Abba. My heart cries Abba, and it's going to get him in all of his fullness forever. You inherit God. (laughs) I can't give you a bigger inheritance than that. Psalm 27, 4, David says, One thing I've asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and meditate in his temple. David, you're going to get that in spades. (laughs) That's what you're going to inherit. For we're told that there'll be no sun in heaven, just the glory of God. There'll be no temple. The lamb will be the altar. That's what you're going to get at the end of all this. Do you want to be encouraged this morning? You get God at the end of this journey. Isn't that better than all the stuff I hear about? 
The first fruits are Abba. And then I get the fullness of all of it and feast on it for all of eternity with a God who's infinite and eternal. I think it misses it when our biggest concern is will there be basketball in heaven or mountains to climb? I always say, yeah, the excellencies of God, you'll be hiking them forever. Is my dog Rover going to be there? Some of these questions, they're fine. Is my husband going to be there? The bridegroom's going to be there. You're going to inherit God at the end of this journey. What an inheritance. Let's say you had a rich aunt die and she sent you a million dollars and when you get home, if you still had mailboxes and you opened it up, there was a million dollar check in there. What would you do? I hope yell or kick your, kick your heels. Some, you're going to be excited in some way. But do you hear what I'm saying to you this morning? If you're a child of God, then you're an heir and your inheritance is God. Did your burden fall off? At the end of this, you inherit God. And so we need the Holy Spirit to let me get this and show my heart what God has laid up for me, for those who have loved His appearing. And all I can think of is the best times that I have ever had in the secret place, where I've had that sense of God and His filial love, and it just takes me over. What will that be like to the infinite degree for forever? You could leave me 10,000, thousand worlds and it would pale in comparison to this inheritance. You know, all of a sudden, the earth and a new body just kind of drops off the table for me. If you're a Christian, your heart should be screaming by the Spirit of God. Lord, this is too much. I'm unworthy. Psalm 73, 25, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And besides thee, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Lamentations 3.24, the Lord is my portion, therefore I have hope in him. So what an inheritance. We have all that God is to be ours forever and eternity. It's an inheritance that you'll never be able to count. It's infinite. And I'll spend eternity growing in my knowledge of how wonderful and infinite my inheritance really is. The commentator Robert Haldane summarized this this way. He said, God is the portion of his people, and in him who is the possessor of heaven and earth, they are heirs of all things. God is all sufficient, and this is an all sufficient inheritance. <clears throat> God is eternal and unchangeable, and therefore it's an internal inheritance, an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that will not fade away. It's God himself, then, who is the inheritance of his children. And he communicates himself to them by his grace, his light, his holiness, and his life. We inherit God, children. <laughs> and one last point, if you'll look with me in verse 17, just one last point on our inheritance, not on the sermon. Don't get excited. If children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ. I got great news for you. Ready for this? Jesus did not sign a prenuptial when he married us. We get all of his inheritance. We get a share in his inheritance. By union with him, we get to share the inheritance that Christ has. And I think of all the, maybe like the prodigal son's brother. Do you remember when, when the prodigal took, I want my inheritance, not you, father. And he takes and he squanders it and he's in the pig slop and he comes back and the father throws a party and puts a ring on his finger. And, and the little self-righteous uh, brother is so sickened and disgusted that he's throwing a party and uh, he's spending my inheritance on my brother's party. He can't enjoy the celebration. There's no joy in him. Christ is not like that older brother. Praise be to God. He delights to share his inheritance with his brothers and sisters. Thank you, Jesus. Well, what does Jesus inherit? A heavenly home made in the likeness of Christ? <laughs> no. What's his inheritance? Well, John 17, 4. He prays, I glorified thee, Father, on earth, 
having accomplished the work which thou hast given me to do, and now glorify thou me together with thyself, Father, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Let us enjoy each other again in the depth of the glory and relationship that we have. The inheritance is the glory of God. The enjoyment of God himself. The perfect delight that they had before the foundation of the world. And in verse 17, heirs with Christ, uh, it says that, that we may also be glorified with him. We get to share that glory. And so I want you to hear this. I am joined to Christ. That's been our whole gospel in Romans. By faith, I'm joined to Christ. I'm one with him. And I'm so one with him. When he died on the cross, it's as if I died on the cross. When he was buried, it's as if all my sins were buried. When he was raised, it's, it's as if I was raised. And now when he gets his inheritance, it's as if it's my inheritance. I get his inheritance. I share it with Jesus. It makes heaven all the better. I get to share it with Christ for all of eternity. Good company makes everything better, doesn't it? How much more with Christ? I get to share his inheritance with him forever. To enjoy this inheritance with Christ is so good. I love when Rutherford said, if I were to die and go to heaven and there was no Christ, it would be hell to me. And if I died and went to hell and there was Christ, it would be heaven to me. I just want Christ. And my inheritance is I'm a joint heir with Christ. I get to enjoy this with him, his inheritance forever. Thank you, big brother, who wants me to enjoy the fullness of what he has. And this also shows the greatness of this inheritance. What would the father give to his son as the reward of the travail of his soul? It must be a large inheritance to such a son as Christ, who hung on a cross to glorify the father. Follow that thought as far as your mind can take it. What would the Father give to the Son? Join heirs. Surely God would only give the best to his Son. And so he gives them the best he has in all the universe. I'll give you the very best. Myself. My glory. And we're join heirs with Christ. What joy and what security if I were to lose this inheritance, Christ would have to lose his. We're joint heirs. We're so joined to Christ that nothing now can separate us from his love. So what should this do for us this morning? It should fill us with hope for the inheritance that we have. And it should help us in our suffering. We're heirs of heaven and we're heirs of his hardship. So I'm going to have fellowship in his reward, but I'm also going to have fellowship in his suffering from now to glory. I'm going to share in his sufferings. That's what Paul's telling us. Philippians 1.29, for to you it's been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. I've given you the gift of faith, and on the same plane, I've given you the gift to suffer for his name's sake. Only the Holy Spirit can bring these together. I need a primer on suffering because our country has taught us some things that are very contradictory to God's ways. And this country has enjoyed a prosperity for a long time. And it's, it's alleviated much suffering. We've, we've come up with creations, investments. We've come up with so many ways to alleviate suffering. And it's surely taken away for most. Give us this day our daily bread where you mean it. We have uh, this little blip in history when the government rewarded Christian ethics and it protected the church. And that is going away. Everything in America is designed to alleviate suffering so that a normal world and life view is how do I not suffer? How do I avoid it? How do I keep it out of my life? And some people, that's their chief end. How do I keep suffering from my life? Parenting has become how do I keep my kids from any suffering as my chief end? I won't let a coach or a teacher, I won't let anyone hurt them. 
They'll never, I'm going to fight all of my days so they don't feel any pain. So the fruit of avoiding suffering at all cost When we can't avoid it, we think something's wrong. And we make up whole theologies that tell you something's wrong if you suffer. God wants you healthy, wealthy, and wise. And so we we have such a wrong thinking of suffering in America, and we're going to need to renew our minds if we're going to think rightly about this. And so what suffering is to do, God's promised it, it will come, is he doesn't want you to cry, God why are you doing this? I, I distrust you. I'm angry at you. <clears throat> I'm hurt. He wants you to cry when suffering comes. Abba, Father, trust, confidence in this relationship that he's planned this, he's decreed it. For my life, I'm crying. I'm not, I'm not doubting Abba. I know he's going to bring it. He told me. I'm just crying for his nearness, his help, his heart. Abba, I want us to get suffering. and Just say no to short-term, short-sighted pleasure. Just say no to ease and temporal comforts and self-preservation. Stop and say yes to whatever I have to suffer with him. Whatever I have to suffer, for his name's sake, I will. Troubles are not inconsistent with our hope of glory. Suffering clears the air and helps us remember what this is all about and what my inheritance is and where I'm going in the kingdom of God. Suffering purifies our hope in the text that Greg Kurtz read in 1 Peter. It purifies it. It cuts flesh off our heart that's growing over it to make it sensitive again to the king and his kingdom. No suffering and we'll just be these little spoiled brats that never grow. There's this plan of God is suffering. And America's whole goal is not to. And we're taking the the world and we're bringing it into the church and we're thinking like it and we're trying to figure out ways in the church to not suffer. And if we do, God's broken and something's wrong with them. Suffering is necessary. And my question, what kind of suffering are we talking about? Look with me in verse 17. He says, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. In verse 18, for again, uh, that's continuing the explanation. For I consider that what? The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed to us. And so the suffering in this context right here is the groaning of our bodies. It's that the the fall has caused us now to decay, to deteriorate, to live in a world that is, is broken and fallen and coming against us. So all the suffering of living in a fallen world with a fallen body and fallen people that are coming upon us. Those those sufferings are our immediate context. And then he tells us in verse 28 that we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. So now the suffering is all things that are hurtful and hard. God will take these things and he'll work them to make us into the image of Jesus Christ. So now it's all things. And then in verses 35 through Uh, 39, look at verse 35 of chapter 8. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, all these things of a fallen world. Just as it is written, now we're looking at persecution. For your sake, we're being put to death all day long. We We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered, but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. And I'm convinced that nothing, and he'll give this whole list can separate us. So we have the fallenness of a world, our bodies, all things, and persecution, and that's going to come upon us for the name of Jesus. And so these sufferings, guys, this is your life from now to glory. It's not the love boat that we're going to journey home on. And so I want you to hear the key, he says in verse 17, if indeed we suffer what? 
with him, not because of him. And so we're, we're suffering with him. And so what I want you to walk away with this morning is suffering will come into your life. It's promised by God, physical, emotional, and spiritual. Hurt, confusion, weariness, loneliness, depression, abandonment, financial disaster, health issues, deep health issues. The list is long and deep and painful, and anyone who's been a pastor knows them well. There's a lot. And whatever you're facing, will you lean on Jesus and trust him? Are you walking away and abandoning him? If this is how he treats his friends, I didn't sign up for this. The true gospel is, yes, you did. You saw the beauty of Jesus Christ and all that he offers. And you said, I will follow you. And I'll walk with you through anything on the way to glory. Nothing's off limits for God to touch in our lives. And one preacher said, every suffering is, are you with Jesus or will you walk away? Will you stay with him at any cost? Because how beautiful he is in this gospel that we've been looking at and what he's done. And this inheritance that he's purchased for me. So I, 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 will, I, I will walk through anything to get to Christ at the end of this path. And it's, it's, it's not a flowery path. John Newton said, suppose a man was going to New York to take possession of a large estate. And on the way, his carriage should break down a mile before he got to the city, which obliged him to walk the rest of the way. What a fool we should think him if we saw him wringing his hands and blubbering all the rest of the walk, saying, my carriage is broken, my carriage is broken. I'm going to glory. With the only inheritance is God. I need suffering. And if you'll go back to Romans 5, when we were outside and the wind was blowing everything, I don't only exult that I have peace with God and that I have the glory of God, but I also exult in my tribulations. I exult in them. He said, because they, they work this proven character and it ends up bringing hope. And that's what we're looking at this morning. These trials come and they bring hope. It's buttressed on chapter 5 and chapter 8. And then chapter 5, the love of God's been shed abroad in our heart to endure these things and to look for that. And now chapter 8, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. Suffer. Glory's coming. It's just, it's the message. Gospel. I'm united to God and I'm going to suffer. I'm going to have to walk through it. And I need to keep my hope fixed on the, on the prize where Jesus is seated. And I'm running and I'm walking through whatever he calls me to. And so I want you to get this with all of my heart. God the Father knows what we need to get to glory. He says, I have a suffering plan, each one of you. God has given you a suffering plan. Your Abba, the nearness of God, your daddy has a suffering plan for you. Whatever you're sitting in here this morning, it's from God. And it's not to destroy you. It's to, to give you hope and what's coming and not make this paradise and not try to get everything right here. I, my hope is the, the inheritance, what's coming. And he'll keep bringing things into my life to make me hope in that. And in his love is that it'll keep me from hoping right here that something here is what's really what I need. What I'm going to live for, love and drink. Thank you, God, for a suffering plan by your love that I would hope in the glory of God. And I have a father who breaks my leg and brings me back from wandering. He's a surgeon that cuts off the flesh of my overgrown heart, I will suffer with him. Suffering is the path to glory. Don't buy the American lie, I beg you. It's the path that God has decreed for each one of his children. And cry, Daddy, have at it. Cause me to fight sin and cry, Abba, by my sufferings. Suffering does that. And it gives you hope and glory. And if you will suffer with Christ, 
You're children of God. No amount of suffering can get me to come off of Christ. Like a gray red, though I don't see him, I love him. And I'm seeing that so powerful in our body. I'm watching some of you suffer like crazy and you won't let go of Christ. You're worshiping him. That's the Holy Spirit and that's the hope of this gospel. Thank you for giving us examples to knock our weary. Being joined to Christ by faith will bring suffering. So why do it? Because it's this path to my inheritance. And my inheritance is God and join heirs with Christ. Bring it on, baby. <laughs> Purify my hope. And as I close, I feel like I need to share this. If you're not children, you will not be joint heirs with Christ. You're going to be joint heirs with the devil. All that has been designed to punish him for his rebellion and sin in the fiery furnace forever, forever, you'll be joint heirs with him. And you'll go there forever. Jesus holds his hands out and says, come to me. I'll save you from that. I went up on a cross and I bore that so you won't have to. Come without works and believe upon Jesus Christ who died for you on a cross and fulfilled the law in your place. Please don't be a joint heir with the devil. I close an application in Ephesians 1.15. Paul said, For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you and your love for all the saints, that's what I see in you guys. I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and and of revelation and the knowledge of him, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. I pray that the Holy Spirit this morning would let your heart see what is laid up for you. Oh, what it would do to the church of God. What would happen if we got that? If we lived in light of that inheritance? We would let goods and kindred go this mortal life also. The grumbling, the worry, unforgiveness. <laughs> I don't have to have it all now. This present suffering is not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed to me. And suffering, don't put your tent stakes down here. Here, Christ said, we have no lasting city. Come outside the gate and suffer with me. Come outside the camp and suffer with Christ. Have fellowship in his sufferings, rejected by a world and spit out and hated, so that you can have fellowship with him and his glory forever. Join heirs. And so praise be to a father that has a plan of suffering for his children and gives us Abba and a near Christ and a Holy Spirit to run the race that is set before us to receive the beautiful inheritance that awaits us. You don't need any more application than that, okay? Well, okay, parenting. God has a suffering plan for your children as well. Teach them. Teach them. Let's pray. Father, this is pure gold. And this inheritance should change the way we think and live and hope and worry. God, we have everything awaiting for us. We are already seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The certainty of being joined to Christ is the absolute certainty of enjoying this inheritance with him forever. God, nothing can separate us from this. Let every heart be overwhelmed. Holy Spirit, let the eyes of their hearts see what is the hope of glory and the inheritance among the saints. Teach us, show us this morning fullness and the beauty and let burdens fall off. Let all of our sufferings 
be put in the right perspective that these beautiful gifts that pull back the veil of your glory so that we can see more of it. God, we can't wait for the finish line. And thank you that you keep growing our hope in it and for it. Father, let this change every human being sitting here this morning. God, let our hearts be taken up with this. And we want to suffer. Father, we want to join in fellowship of Christ's sufferings and walk as he walked and endure whatever path and plan you have laid out for us. Help us not to be falling apart with a country that's falling apart in a world. For we have a kingdom that cannot be shaken. When all the other kingdoms are shaken, this one will stand forever and we have been brought into it. And it is coming. It's going to come down like a perfect cube and we're going to dwell in the new heavens and the new earth forever with God. (laughs) What an inheritance. We could ask for nothing more. Let us go live in light of it. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.